Hello and welcome back to the Cricket District Show with myself, Jack, Nikhil and Toby. And in today's episode, I would like to talk all about commentary. Very lucky to have you alongside us. I know you don't like talking about it loads and like self-promotion, but we have to point out that you've commentated on some incredible tournaments in the last year or two at least. Um, and what, 22 now? I'm 22, Jack. Yes, I am. But important to say that I have done nothing as yet and I'm just scratching the surface, but grateful for the opportunities. And when did your commentary journey actually start? Um, I was 12 years old and I was playing cricket, had the aspirations to become an international cricketer. We can all see how that worked out. It didn't. Um, anyways, but someone at my club, his name is Gary Bell. He had a camera set up and just like taking footage of guys playing so that they can sort of watch it back, try to improve on their game. And then he tried to add different aspects to it. And funny enough, he's the person that's streaming the cricket in Barbados right now. So the draw for Archer clip that went viral yeah. is his stream. Huh. Um, so he's actually it's developed into something huge. Um, he's also the analyst for the West Indies women's team. So big up Gary, because I owe him a lot for how far I've come. But basically, he was one of the few people that believed in me from the beginning. And I used to annoy him a lot. But basically, he set up that camera and then he was like looking for people to sort of commentate. And he just saw me around the club and he knew that I was kind of loud and liked to talk a lot. And I was playing for, we had two teams that year. Second team, I was captain. Our game got rained out. So I came to watch the first team. Uh, wasn't good enough to get in the first team. Anyways, um, still hurts me to this day. But anyways, when it came there, he was like, why don't you just try this? And I'll never forget that day when I just taught for the first time. And then when I went home, I was like, wow, like I really like that. But from about 12 to 16, I just thought it was like a fun hobby. Yeah. And then I think the path started to show where my cricket was going and where the commentary was going that I should probably take the commentary seriously. That's interesting because a lot of people I reckon at home think that it's very easy while well, you just talk about cricket but it's definitely not and Toby I know you've dabbled in a bit of commentary European cricket yeah my one and only experience of cricket <laughs> commentary um, I went out to Portugal and <laughs> commentated on European cricket mm. being played um, essentially one of the guys who plays in Portugal um, I, I think the, oh, I'm trying to remember what the Anidas or something like that the cricket club's called um, has basically basically built a cricket ground in his backyard yeah. um, I say backyard like he lives on a farm um, and European cricket has been played there for the last three or four years um, and cool. essentially I went out there to tell a cool story for Cricket District and Vinny Sandu Mr Maximo mm. who you've probably heard on uh, ECN before um, just said do you want to put the headset on do you want to commentate and it was great fun but um, yeah that was my one and only experience yeah. I'm quite happy just taking videos and did you, did you find it difficult? Yeah, it's um, that's a really important point. I think a lot of people just turn on the TV or listen to the radio and assume that commentary is easy and straightforward because you watch cricket and you tell people what's going on in the field and actually the ability to articulate what's happening on the field without talking too much um, or yeah. talking over anyone um, and having you know the knowledge of all of the nuances and the, the technical areas of the game is... Um, yeah, it's a real skill. It's a real talent and something that actually even the best commentators in the world still have to work on on a regular basis and practice and yeah. do their research. And yeah, it's not an easy job. Yeah, I think the most difficult thing from my experience, and again, as you just said, is something that I think every single time I pick up my I try to work on. Mm. And there's so much that I have to improve on. But the probably the hardest thing is how do you complement, especially TV commentary, how do you complement the pictures that the viewer is seeing at home? Because obviously they can see that Joe Root has just hit a cover drive for four. It's not like radio where you would need to tell them that. But it's like, what can Nikhil Utam Chanani say that Toby is at home listening and he's like, well, yeah, that's a good point. Like, mm. I didn't know that. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest challenge. And there's, it's, it's quite complex. But I think if you really love it and you sort of are passionate about the sport and can express yourself and stuff, I think it's a great, something great to get into. And people ask me all the time, how do you get into it? I think... You just start by commentating on a game. It doesn't need to be a high level. You just start by commentating. But speaking of experiences, Jack Mitra also is in the commentary box in Antigua. <laughs> I think I was behind. I think, did I force you? I told you you have to you, commentate. You definitely were scrabbling around <laughs> for someone to fill 10 overs. And, and how was your Jack? experience? I just found it so difficult, honestly. Um, it was really hard, actually. And I didn't understand, which I'm going to ask you in a minute. I didn't understand the color, is it called? Mm. And what, what's the other one called? Lead and color. What, explain that. So the lead is like a ball by ball person. They're like sort of to call the moment. So when someone hits a big six, he's the that's the first person you hear or wicket, first person you hear. And then the color or analyst is like the mainly, most of the time it's like a pass player, 
who will then sort of analyze, okay, so let's say Chris Gale hit a huge 106 meter six. Yeah. If I'm the lead, I'll call that moment like mammoth or huge or what a shot. And then if Toby's the pass player, he'll be like, oh, well, how, tell us how did Chris Gill hit that? Was it the bat lift? Was it, um, is it sort of his mentality this year? Any, any which way, but yeah, and uh, that's the analysis part and the lead. Yeah, I didn't get any of that. I was just, <laughs> as they're running, <laughs> and into in ball, and that's all I was trying to do each time to make sure that you're covering it. And you do forget when you're watching it, you forget that people can see what mm. you're already seeing. So you're right in, in terms of trying to, I can, I can see now talking to you how, you have to think outside of just the pitch. And yeah, the you can't be too descriptive, on. can you? And you also have to love the game. I think that's mm. something that comes across in your work is you're so passionate about cricket and about the characters involved and about the atmosphere mm. in these stadiums around the world. And I think that has to come across, that has to translate. And I think when you turn on the radio, or you turn on the TV, you instantly get a feel for what's happening in the game by the commentator's tone yeah, of voice right. and, and the way they're communicating what's happening with their audience. Yeah. I also really like radio though, to be honest. Mm. Um, I've had some experience doing radio and I think probably because like, since the viewer is not seeing anything, you have control into that narrative that you want them to believe. Yeah. It's a lot harder, sorry, it's not a lot harder, but I think they're both equally hard because in radio, you're talking a lot. Mm. There's no sort of, in, in TV, we like to say like, let it breathe. Whereas you can hear the, uh, off the bat, you can hear like, like I remember World Test Championship last year, they were like, let's just listen in for over because the atmosphere was so good. Uh, whereas on radio, you can't do that because people will switch it off. So yeah. it's like, they're both complex and obviously people like prefer, prefer to see, but radio is a huge thing when people are driving, when mm. people can't necessarily watch and it's cool to like, have to be able to do both of them. Also in switch between those modes, like mm. Isha Gu is a great example of that, right? Mm. She'll be on for five overs on radio and then she'll, go next door and do five right. hours on Sky. Yeah. And I just wonder what that kind of challenge is like. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I think you've once, just been on, have yeah, you yeah, switched between and you've got to realize that on radio, you're describing what's happening. And on TV, you're trying to add a bit of analysis right. and detail and atmosphere. I think like Harsha Bogle is a pro at that. He's been doing it for like probably 20 years. Yeah. He did it in the last series earlier this year where he did TV and then just went downstairs to talk sport instantly. Mm. But my first experience of that was in the England series last year, West Indies, England. And it was extremely tough mm. because you're in a mode where you're saying, all right, we need to talk a lot. We need to describe. And then when you get on TV, it's like, it's like, breathe. You don't, you're not speaking so much. And you almost, like, I've caught myself many times. Like, I didn't need to say that. Like, yeah. I'm so in that mode. So yeah, it's, it's tough, man. And credit to everyone, all the, the legends of the game who do it. You mentioned legends of the game there. I'd love to ask you what it's like. Like you've brushed shoulders with A.B. De Villiers, mm. Sean Pollock recently, Kevin Peterson in the SA20 and a number of other like legends of the game. What's it like when you first walk into that press box or you first walk into that, you know, training session as it were, ahead of a big tournament? I know we, we were with you at SA20 mm. and you said your first day was quite surreal. Just for your average cricket fan, what's it like walking into that room? Yeah, to be honest, I think it's, from the time I decided at 16 that I was gonna, that I wanted to try and become a commentator, that was probably one of the most surreal moments for me. When I walked in on SA20 and it was Ravi Shastri, Mark Nicholas, Kevin Peterson. It's just the names, A.B. de Villiers, the names and what those guys had achieved in, in the world, whether that's in commentary, whether that's in playing cricket, to then realize that I was sort of working alongside them and having the ability to learn from them. It was like, wow, like, that I think it's sort of a sign that it's something that I really should pursue and yeah. take very seriously. Um, but yeah, I remember just shaking. And I we had a, like a funny story. So the rain fell that day, first day of the SA20, and guys were all over. Some guys were on the field doing like analysis, other guys were things. So I had to almost welcome it from the commentary box. And I remember they did like a rehearsal and I was shaking. I was so nervous that I couldn't even get out the words. Luckily when we went live, I did, but I mean, and it's something that I've done for a long time, as in mm. I've spoken on a mic, so it's nothing new, but yeah. just of who I was around and where I was, it was crazy, man. But yeah, privilege, man, really privilege. Mm. That's cool. I was going to ask you along, mention those names there. Mm. I don't know if you can pick out one or not, but is there somebody that you enjoy commentating with the most or have a, feel like you've got a good connection with? Because I feel like it's a, a lot about that, mm. having that, that bounce off somebody else. Yeah, two guys, I think. And again, there are so many, but since you asked, one person obviously is Ian Bishop. He's a huge mentor to me. Um, someone who I've learned a lot from and I've annoyed a lot in the past year <laughs> or two. Um, and everyone knows why I choose him because everyone, a lot of people think he's the greatest of all time or, or one of the best right now. But actually working with Stuart Broad at the SA20, it was really cool because to have him 
someone who's just come out of cricket with his insight the amount of knowledge he has it made it so easy for me to then be like what do you think or what would you do in this situation and then he just sort of take it away even not commentating even we've had experience with him filming with him he's always so like always thinking about something about the game so I, yeah I, I got that through his commentary as well I also get the sense that he put you at ease yeah, like definitely. straight away I think a lot of these guys what we encounter with cricket is that they're massive names and they've played all over the world and they've played 100 tests or they've scored 20 T20 hundreds or whatever it is and, yeah. and like the majority of them are very humble you know very generous with their time like they appreciate what it's like mm. for someone like us to be working our way into cricket mm. and I think it's so important that you surround yourself with people who support you and lift you up in the industry because it's a yeah. small world cricket and I think you found that in particular and we had some real good paddle sessions so <laughs> yeah. they had a day where me Toby short broad played and then even we, we two of us played with Vernon Philander and like it's amazing how much I think those off-field relationships come out in the commentary box. Definitely. Because then I like have an understanding, okay, like what was Brody find funny or like what does he like to talk about? It's just great, man. Honestly, it's like such a privileged position. I think to work in cricket, I've said it on the podcast before, but to work in cricket, I think we all are so blessed. Yeah. We get to fly around the world to amazing destinations and see the world and, and also do what we love, which is why I always tell people like, Younger children in Barbados, like at the end of the day, only 11 players can go on that field. But cricket has so many avenues of work. Like we're fortunate in this part of the world that you can literally do so much in the sport. Mm. Yeah, it is interesting. You mentioned briefly there your days off, what you get up to. Mm. Can you talk us through like a little bit about what goes on on an actual game day? Like when does it start? What's your process? Mm. How, how so does it work? It, yeah, it's a little different for me because... I'm not a past player. So for the past players, they don't necessarily realize, uh, some of them do, some of them, is everyone has their own style, but a lot of them sort of just rely on their knowledge, the bank of information that they have from their playing days, which is what you expect and what you want to hear from them. For me now, obviously having not played, I have to do a lot more research to learn and sort of make up that lost ground um, and, and to try to tell stories and try to find interesting trends. So for me on game day, so if I take you from pretty much before the tournament, what I like to do is pretty much for every player have, I can actually show you guys, I have my book here. Um, so this is like, obviously you're not gonna be able to understand my handwriting, sorry in advance, but what I like to do is I have like the player here, how many matches they've played and then like anything interesting I picked out. So this was like a CPL game. I have Imranta here. He has 20 wickets at Warner Park which then gives me sort of context when going into the game that, look, he's very good at this venue, which I can yeah. then enhance on in the game. But on, so this would be done pretty much hopefully before the tournament. On game days, it's sort of like just trying to conceptualize the matchup. So what do I want? What are the 10 things that I really think are important? And have that on a small piece of paper and just sort of like visualize a little bit. If I have to do a pitch report that day, we tend to get the running order like night before. Mm. So if I, want, if I have to do a pitch report, sometimes I even rehearse like in the mirror <laughs> because obviously I'm still learning and tosses and stuff are very new. So that would be a little bit of it. And then you get to the ground two and a half hours before. I like to walk around, get a little atmosphere in, see the pitch, talk to some players. And yeah, that's about it, man. I've got visions of it. you uh, <laughs> tapping your carpet in your hotel room. Like, oh, no, <laughs> I just love the idea of your, yeah, the room next to you, just hearing you go, hello, yeah, welcome yeah, yeah. to Water Park. Because <laughs> I'm projecting, so it's quite long. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but like the key thing is research, mm. right? And I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. It's like the amount of planning and preparation it takes to be... Yeah. Well, to be honest, be anyone in cricket, but yeah. like be a commentator specifically because there's so own. much. Well, I don't know, but like I think you need to be so on it and particularly mm. in a T20 match where something massive happens. Actually, you're in a test match, but like T20, you've got these players who have so many different characteristics and they play particular shots and big moments are going to be clipped up on mm. social media. Yeah. And if you don't get it right, people are straight in the comments. comments saying, why is he saying right, this? He's actually got 21 wickets at Warner Park. Mm. Well, that's yeah. the thing. So have you ever had any moments where you've, th you've, you've fluffed up you know you've, yeah, had, you've yeah, made definitely, mistakes definitely you make mistakes all the time man um hopefully you like realize and then you say correction or you try yeah. to like correct it in the same thing but i think sometimes it's like human you know so everybody will make mistakes um but like i know we're talking commentary but i know something that's always fascinated me about cricket district when i work tournaments with y'all is the planning and the way how organized and structured y'all are coming i'm talking about like they even have captions ready before the content is even done or even sh filmed so Tell us about your preparation, especially for a tournament at SA20, where you're doing a game, you're flying the next day, doing another game. Mm. What is it? What did it look like? I guess a lot of it is a little bit like your list of 10 things you want to get. Mm. Like before getting there, we have a think about what the style of the game is, what's important 
who's important mm-hmm. particularly and then focusing on that player with the content that we capture specifically or for example where whether it's uh, um, St George's Park we're like okay we know the atmosphere is good we know that we're going to have a power half an hour get stuck in right in the crowd there's a photo behind you there now of what like some of the pictures that came from there so it's like a like a hit list of things we'd like to get ideally like you say sometimes with captions ready um but yeah it's all about again research into what we want to get i think that's also the beauty of what we're able to do is that we can have a list of things that we really want to get but we can also be really reactive because we're not there just to film one angle or we're not just there to get one player's photo it's like right we've got these three or four videos we want to do we've also heard this song yesterday which would be perfect for a video like this Uh, and we also spoke to this player and it turns out he celebrates like this so next time he does it can he look this way like little things like that that we're we're learning and developing and like you said like a lot of it comes down to relationships Mm. you have with the right soldier the broadcaster the players the coaches and like if they trust you with the access that's a massive boost isn't it mm. and how does the brainstorming process like is it just two of y'all in the office with your third employee jacob smith captain of eastbourne cricket club <laughs> who also designed this kit which is fire by the way <laughs> um is it sort of just that you guys sit down and just hash, hashing out ideas how does it like how do you get those 10 things a secret okay a, sorry fair enough a plain storm I just gave it all mine. No, our secret is a plane storm. <laughs> because it a plane storm. An aeroplane. aeroplane mode. You put your oh. phone in aeroplane mode, you brainstorm. Right. Yeah. And a lot of time when you're on a flight, rather than sitting watching mm. whatever they've got on the film or TV programs, just our notes pages are usually full by the end of the mm. flight, just mm. writing ideas down. And you're, it's, so, it's all well and good sometimes trying to look for ideas when you're on your phone or on your laptop, like searching for inspiration. Mm. But a lot of the time, our best content has come from finding something new that no one's done before that we think of when we're out and about somewhere not on a phone and talking about what content we would want to see yeah. as fans so like we're on our way to SA20 I remember having this conversation we're like right if we weren't there what would we want to see on Cricket District or yeah. another platform and then that kind of guides your conversation a bit but we our best ideas don't generally come when we're in the office or even at a game it's like if we're out on a run mm. or like playing golf or yeah. like having dinner and just like something in your life kind of inspires you mm-hmm. to you know think about a way of doing things and then you just develop it with a bit of research and yeah. get your final outcome and also before we move on touch on that point about music as well it's like a massive part of video specifically mm-hmm. I find like it can make or break a video yeah. Yeah. very very easily well. and a lot of people think you just make it and then you just oh, chuck that song on it's like no you get it beforehand and that's what builds the idea that you build the the intros the outros and I know we're it can also away, make but... or break a cricket tournament and that oh, a bad DJ at a cricket match Brian. I've still got scars <laughs> but we'll move on from that <laughs> we have a weird confession you know you said that his best ideas come from exercise for some reason I don't know I've been trying to figure this out my best ideas are coming in the shower yeah, and that the shower it's pulse. costly because sometimes I find myself bathing for 20 and 25 minutes <laughs> because I'm just so much locked in that I don't want to come out but again it's, the, it's probably just about not being yeah, with something oh, or a laptop got, not get too philosophical on you but like Ryan Holiday Stoic philosopher has a great book called Stillness is the Key talks all about how our best work our best productivity or our best ideas come when we're not doing anything else yeah. when we're chop wood carry water we're in the shower there's no other distractions you can let your mind go free mm. I think that's yeah, yeah I totally understand that next up my question comes about venues and specifically well first first question what is your favourite venue to commentate at? Two of them. Port Elizabeth, Aberha. Um, Great pronunciation. That, yeah, I've been working on that. And that's because <laughs> of the crowd. Um, and like orange skies and damn. And also in SA20, they had this cool thing. We were commentating from a couch in the stand. So they had it like, like it. on the grass mound. Just a couch, two seats. And we were like doing it sometimes from there. And Providence. That CPL final last year, Guyana won. I, I have It's hard to witness something like that. But I've never commentated in India, so I'm sure it'll be right up there. Like, can you imagine CSK in the final this year in Chennai? But, Quite yeah. a lot of it depends on where the press box is, doesn't it? Sorry, oh, where yeah, the, like, the commentary yeah. station is, and like, yeah. if they've got double glazing, can you hear? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear enough of the yeah. action? Like, it, and that kind of translates to your experience of the game, and therefore right, exactly. your commentary. Because like Johannesburg is extremely far away. Yeah, the box. Whereas Port Elizabeth is like you're, you're almost over, it, over the it? field. Yeah. Mm. yeah. We can extend that question. Media yeah. centre, Toby. Any favourites come to mind? Uh, you mentioned the Wanderers there. That is so cool because yeah. it's completely open and you are you feel like you're right over the action. Mm. Um, Newlands, Cape Town, very cool because you've got the view of Table Mountain. But um, 
you feel quite far from the action. Yeah. Centurion's yeah. awesome. Centurion's really cool. Super Sport Park. Also, sort of open. also oh, outdoor, yeah. Actually, yeah. open air. Um, Lords, because the food is unbelievable. I was just about to say, there's the next question. What's the best food you've had? You know, I've heard that, country? but I've never had that. Right. All the players and everybody talk about it. Lords' food is like unmatched. I think my favorite is, I think it's the oval, because you get to yeah. choose if you sit inside or outside. And luckily enough, there's usually a seating plan and we're usually put outside, which I like, mm -hmm. which is great. I think my favourite memory of the Ashes was sitting with you mm. in the outdoor press box. We were right behind. We were like in between the line of keeper and first slip. Mm. Edge comes through. Johnny Besto stands still. Joe Root takes an unbelievable Bang. catch behind him and then like looks up and celebrates. Not that he was looking at us, but like looking at the stand that we're next to. Yeah. Like, and, and to see stuff like that in real time, I feel like that's a real privilege that, that we get, the three of us, is like... Yeah. And I feel like you probably see everything. But for us, a lot of the time we're head down in laptops, but that was one time where we were both just like we both looked watching the action, ball. just heard that of it sticking oh, in his hand. It's <sighs> so cool. Yeah, yeah, so cool. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I've been trying to think for the last five minutes, where has the best food? <laughs> and I have to big up my friends because my friends that are caterers at these grounds, they know that I'm six foot four and they save a lot extra for me. <laughs> um, and in Guyana, oh my goodness. <coughs> Basically, I used to do like, a lot of things before the game and yeah. that's when everybody would eat before the game starts because like a six if it's a seven o'clock start everyone eats at like six mm. but i used to like to eat like once i was done everything and more relaxed so i could just focus on not eating and just working at first and i had some great friends in ghana who they catered and they've purposely saved food for me they knew exactly how i loved it and they just gave me extra they cut things for me baked things for me i love you <laughs> <laughs> and i hopefully will be back this year that sounds good <laughs> yeah it was nice okay i have one final question and this is about a particular moment that we witnessed. Mm. You have some good connections in the cricketing world with some players through your commentary experience. Mm. One of those, Rakim Cornwall, you get on very well with. Mm. We even saw your connection, a video on Cricket Dish. Only person to ever get Rakim <laughs> Cornwall out twice in and over. <laughs> we, can, we can keep bringing that up for you, just, just for that. <laughs> but I want to ask, there was a moment where he got run out, unfortunately, during mm. the CPL. What's it like for you? How do you stay mm. neutral in those moments to make sure you're just covering the action and not having that emotional connection with a player that you get on with. Yeah, me and Jumbo are good. Um, we've built a relationship from way before I commentated when I was in the US and he used to play there. Um, but yeah, as you said, I think it's one of the, and a lot of players will have this, um, sorry, a lot of other commentators will have this because remember someone like a short broad will commentate on England test series yeah. and he's played with a lot of them. But at the end of the day, I think it's just about sort of detaching. I don't think I ever be critical of any player because I didn't, I wasn't physically able to go out there and do what they're doing. But it was really interesting to go through sort of the roller coaster ride because in that CPL you mentioned, at the beginning of the tournament there was that run out. I was on commentary for it. It was obviously, it was kind of a, it's hard to put it. It was entertaining for fans watching, mm. but it kind of was, I think for me, a little disappointing to see the reaction because yes, he has his implications with fitness and stuff, but. Many people don't really know the story and we had a chat with him about his sort of knee replacements and the injuries that he's faced and suffered. So obviously you don't want to see a guy getting run out in that nature and then being almost quote unquote laughed at. But yeah. it was the perfect comeback probably two weeks later when this man scored 100 at Kensington Noble and did the backdrop, like yeah. the infamous backdrop. And it was almost like, and if you all know uh, Raheem Cornwall, he's not one that has many words at all. So after all of that hate and criticism and laughter, he wouldn't have said anything. No. He would have just done his thing, continued, whatever, whatever. But the backdrop was like, it was perfectly for him. Mm. And luckily, some way, somehow, the universe aligned that I would be on commentary for that. And boy, Jack, I could not believe it. Like, <laughs> when he was on, so I think we, I, you do it in like five over stints. I, I sat down and I was like, hitting like this is not really possible. And in the 90s, he was almost taken at long on. And after that, went for six. I think he was 96. And I started to prepare something. Like, write a little, just two lines on what I wanted to say so that I would be able to nail that moment like you mentioned. And yeah, I think I did pretty decently. Um, Do you remember what you said? Yeah, I said, the Patriots are victims of a rack attack. Um, and just about talking about the nature of the innings, it was blockbuster. And at the end, I ended it with, he is must-see TV. You nailed it. Um, yeah. Absolutely nice nailed one. it, man. And it was it, so, like, it was so cool for us to... Because we obviously went to that mm. first week in St. Lucia. We caught up with you. That moment happened. You were on comms. Like, there are so many emotions that went through it. And then to switch on the TV and see him get 100 and hear your voice. No, to see how far you've both mm. come was just 
a wicked turn of events. No, yeah, it was sick. Honestly, that's probably probably the best moment of my commentary career. Do you reckon? Right up there. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. That's I like it. That's because it was like someone I close to, but also it's like hundred and T twenty cricket, huge. like in that nature, the way he mm. did it, it was yeah. really cool. I reckon we end it on that. A nice positive note. Thank you for letting us in on some commentary secrets of yours. Yeah, anytime, man. I want to tell. I mean, there are a lot of children out there, as I said, that want to play this sport, but there are a few because of our presence on social media and a million other creators and influencers. They also want to become media practitioners in cricket. And I want to say, like, just reach for it, go for it. And we have phones now. The power of the phones is that it just takes one video. As these guys have shown, they started out with zero followers and they're at three million billion actually <laughs> um and they continue to grow and inspire me so definitely you guys go for it and, and don't hold back the sky's the limit one thing i will say is that like i think the opportunity has actually never been bigger because definitely. what you do you create content as well as commentate and i think commentators used to i imagine just if they wanted to be on live tv or live mm -hmm. radio they send in a tape of them commentating yeah. whereas cpl's SA20s, they see you on TikTok and Instagram, mm. be like, oh, that guy would be great. So the opportunity has never been greater. If you want to work with us, our DMs are always open. If you want any advice from this man, he always responds to his texts. <laughs> if you give him one to three business days. <laughs> 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 Thanks for watching this episode of the Cricket District Show. If you liked it, feel free to drop a comment. Let us know what you want to talk about next. And we'll see you soon.